Okay, so we are back. This should be now the second video in the West Memphis three case. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time talking about much of anything else. Let's get right into the video. If you missed the first video, part one, I will put it in the description box and there might be a third video, part three coming after. And if there is, I will also put that in the description box. Okay, in the first part of this video, we talked about the three boys who went missing and were found murdered in Robin Hood Hills in West Memphis, Arkansas. And we talked a little bit about their parents, where they said they were the night the boys went missing, what kind of part they took in the search for the boys, and kind of their relationships with each other and their children. We also talked about satanic panic and how decades leading up to the early 90s contributed to what ended up happening in this case. So now I wanna talk about the three teenage boys that were implicated in this crime, how they came to be implicated in this crime, their trial, and what happened after. So Jerry Driver, helpful juvenile probation officer, goes to the police with this list of eight names of local teenagers he believes to be involved in satanic activity. And we only know of four names on that list. Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., Jason Baldwin, Damian Eccles, and Dominique Tier. 16-year-old Jason Baldwin had come to the attention of local law enforcement when he and a couple other local kids had gone to a private property area where there was a bunch of broken down cars and I think cars that were being fixed, I'm not sure, but he and the other kids basically just busted out the windows and were just messing around. Now, I kind of already talked before about how it didn't feel like there was a ton to do in this town and I find that when you're bored and you're young and there's not a ton of things to do, you find yourself getting into trouble. Now, I don't consider myself to be a, a bad person and I don't consider myself to have been a bad kid either, but when kids are bored, they get into trouble. One day, my mom took me and one of my friends to one of her doctor's appointments and I think I was about 13 at this time. As we're waiting for my mom who was in with the doctor, we hang out in the parking garage and there's a lower level and a higher level and we're on the higher level and for some reason because we'd been waiting a long time we were bored we didn't have anything to do we were like let's throw rocks at these cars down on this lower level and i don't know why we did it but we just did and ended up breaking the windshield of one of the cars we got caught we got in trouble my mom had to pay for the windshield to be fixed and i felt terrible because we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. My mom worked two jobs to kind of just pay the bills. She was a single mother and we weren't poor and I never felt like we didn't have enough. She never let us feel that way, but she definitely didn't have the money to be paying out of pocket for somebody's windshield that her juvenile delinquent of a daughter had broken for no reason. But what, I, what I'm what i saying is, what I'm saying is it's so easy to look at the police record of a young kid, and we're gonna go into this more with Damien as well, but it's so easy to look at that and say, wow, like that kid was bad news and you could tell from the start. What kind of kid trespasses on private property and then just starts breaking a bunch of cars up? But there's always more to the story than you can just see in a police report. So it's always important to keep that in mind because it's really easy to judge based on somebody's past and history and actions, but there's always more behind the scenes. Jason Baldwin's mother suffered with schizophrenia. I'm pretty sure she had a little bit of a drug and alcohol problem, and she also worked nights. But Jason would have to stay home in the evenings and take care of his siblings. There would be times where his mother wouldn't come home at night or for days even because she was struggling with some issues of her own. And he would basically be the father to these younger kids. He would get them off the bus or get them home from school, get them fed, bathed, ready for bed, help them with their homework. Not only was he really good with his own younger siblings, but the people in his neighborhood basically would entrust him with their kids all the time. He was sweet and gentle and smart and kind. He was artistic. He was really, really good with kids because everybody in his neighborhood said, yeah, he watches our kids all the time. They're always over there. He's really good with them. But Jason Baldwin did a couple of things that put him under the microscope of suspicion. He wore black, he wore concert tees, he wore his sandy hair long, and his best friend was Damien Eccles. 
Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. was 17 years old and he lived with his father in West Memphis, Arkansas. Jesse was often referred to as simple and it obviously turns out that he had a lower IQ. I've heard it said his IQ was anywhere from like 68 to 73, but let's just assume on that scale, it's still a low IQ and he was functioning at basically a five-year-old's level as far as mentality goes. He had struggled in school, he'd been held back two grades, and eventually he just ends up dropping out of high school, starts working with his dad, fixing cars and things. But his real dream is to be a professional wrestler. All five foot one of him, and I think he might have weighed like 120 pounds at the time, he wanted to be a professional wrestler wrestler. One of the main things that put Jesse on the police's radar initially was he had stolen flags from the high school marching band. So he'd already dropped out of school at this point. He wasn't a student there anymore and he wanted to build a racetrack in his backyard. So apparently he has other interests besides professional wrestling. He wants to be a race car driver too. So he wants to build a racetrack in his backyard and he needs flags because every racetrack needs flags. And this kind of shows you also the way he processed information and the way he kind of thought about things like a spontaneous small child. So he knew the school's marching band had flags of the kind that he wanted and he went to the school and stole the flags and then displayed them publicly in his yard on his racetrack. This is not the thought process of a grown man who's like, if I steal these flags, I will get caught if I display them. He's a kid, you know, he's like, oh, I can't wait to get these flags. I'm gonna steal them and then I'm gonna put them on my racetrack and nobody's ever gonna question it. So his thought process isn't a, a really mature one. It's not the thought process of a 17 year old, I should say. Jesse was known by all the neighborhood kids. They loved him, they loved playing with them. He was pretty much on their level. You know, he would have a lot of fun with them and their parents really loved that Jesse was good with kids too because they would often just be like, oh, Jesse's got all the kids and they'd be able to do their own thing. So nobody was ever afraid of leaving their kids with Jesse and Miss Kelly Jr. He was known as the type of guy who would always help you out. He'd watch your kids, mow your lawn, do basic repairs for you if you needed it. He was always there, he was helpful and respectful. Now we come to 18 year old Damien Eccles and I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into his history and his backstory because I think he's I think he's a lot harder to understand than Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. or Jason Baldwin. Jason and Jesse are a little bit more relatable. They got into your average kind of like young kid trouble, but really nothing like Damien who had an extensive background with trauma, with law enforcement, with psychiatric hospitals. I wanted to give as much information about his background as possible so that you can understand why he would eventually become the person that everybody suspected to be a child murderer. There is a lot of people that still think these three teenagers killed Chris Byers, Stevie Branch, and Michael Moore. And I am not sure what I believe at the end of the day, but I know that using Damien's past history and his juvenile history at that against him as kind of proof of why he would murder and torture three little boys isn't really fair or accurate, especially the way it's portrayed. Now, I actually read his medical records, something like 511 pages, and I, I read every page, I read all the little notes, I read everything, and the conclusion that I came to after reading them was not that this is like a dangerous person, but that this was a person who needed help and didn't really have anybody around who was fighting for him. Damien was born Michael Wayne Hutchinson on December 11th, 1974 in West Memphis, Arkansas. He moved around a lot with his family. At one point, he had moved to six different states within two years. His family consisted of Joe Hutchinson, his father, Pam Hutchinson, his mother, and there was also Michelle, his little sister. Damien had grown up poor all his life. And when I say poor, I mean really, really poor. Like the houses they would move into sometimes didn't have running water or electricity or heat. Sometimes it had electricity, but no heat or running water. It was just, it wasn't a great situation 
to grow up in. It also turns out that he had very few adults he could actually trust and turn to. Now he does recall being really close with his grandmother who he calls Nanny. So Nanny wasn't actually his blood grandmother. Her husband had actually had an affair with a local Native American woman and Pam, Damien's mother, was the result of that affair. But Nanny didn't really seem to care. She didn't treat Pam any differently. She treated her as if she was her own. She couldn't have kids of her own. So she raised Pam like a daughter and Damien and Michelle like grandchildren and never really thought anything about it, which does say a lot about her character, I think. And Damien was really close to her and even ended up living with her for a little while after his sister was born because his mother Pam didn't think she could handle taking care of two children. So Damien got sent to live with his grandmother for a little bit. So as I said, some of these places he lived can barely be considered livable, rundown shacks. At one point, him and his family moved into a brick structure in somebody's backyard that was rigged for electricity, but didn't have heat, didn't have running water, just kind of haphazardly like thrown together. Probably wasn't a legal residence to be living in. Places where you would regularly hear rats shuffling around in the dark when you're trying to sleep. You know, I grew up in, in a state of poverty that most people in the U.S. probably don't even realize exists in our country. You know, they probably think it's more like something from third world countries. Describe it. There were times we didn't even have electricity or running water. You know, when I was a kid, my family would have to carry five-gallon buckets to other places to get water and bring back to the house. And you would have to heat that up over the fire and pour it into a tub just to take a bath. And then when you're the kid, you take a bath after everyone else, so you're using their bath water, basically. So obviously, poverty of this magnitude can be stressful for not only the parents who have to worry about where the money's gonna come from to pay the bills, but the children who are in the household. And he did feel this, and he sensed it, especially with his father, who was ashamed of being poor, who was ashamed that he couldn't provide for his family. And although when Christmas came, there were local charities that helped out Damien and his family by bringing them Christmas dinner and little gifts and candies. And Damien's mother, Pam, was really grateful for this and would cry and hug them and say thank you. And Damien remembers being really excited whenever these people would come because he knew they had food and little candies. Like I said, he called them Christmas candies. But, but Joe Hutchison was always embarrassed and ashamed that he had to take charity. He didn't feel like he was a man. If he couldn't provide for his family and he had to take a handout, it beat him down. It caused resentment and issues with the marriage. And eventually the two would end up getting separated when Damien was about six or seven years old. So he would have been in second grade at the time. Now, if you want to know more about the background to Damien Eccles, more than I tell you, you should absolutely read his book, Life After Death. It's a, it's a really good book. It gives a lot of insight. And of course, it's from his point of view. So is it 100% true? I don't know. I couldn't tell you that. I was very entertained by it, but, and it gave me a lot more information and insight into what kind of life he lived leading up to when we see him on TV and in documentaries in 1993. So of course, Pam and Joe tell Damien and Michelle, like your father's still gonna see you, don't worry, everything's gonna be just the same, we're just gonna be living in different places. And that did happen for a while, but it was quickly put to a stop when Damien's mother remarried a man named Jack Eccles. Now Jack Eccles was 20 years her senior and a heavy churchgoer. He was really into going to church. And that's where she actually met him, was at church, and for some reason, you know, he gave her attention. She enjoyed that. She hadn't really probably been feeling too great about herself since the divorce. Jack Eccles paid attention to her, made her feel special and pretty, and you know, she fell for him in some way. I'm not sure why. And Damien really was never sure why either, but we don't know. The heart wants what it wants. Keep in mind that this is Damien's first like real experience or negative experience with the Catholic religion because he remembers Jack Eccles as being one of the worst people that he'd ever met yet. He went to church more than anybody that he'd ever met. You know? Now Jack Eccles is going to church three to four times a week, but this is also a man who would punch 
their chihuahua Pepper off of the bed because she had the gall to jump on the bed while he was praying. So he just punched her off the bed. He wouldn't miss an opportunity to bully Damien or make him feel stupid or dumb or bad or even physically um, assault him as well. Damien doesn't remember Jack as being all bad in those days though. He does recall that Jack didn't really care what he wore, what music he listened to, if he pierced his ears, and even though Pam would kind of voice her concern over these kinds of activities, Jack was just like, don't worry, he's just trying to find himself, and Damien looks back and appreciates him for that. It also says something to me about Damien's character where he can find the good and, and the bad in almost anybody. And he even says that Jack Eccles was just a man. He was good and he was bad. So he's able to look at people in, in the way I really like to look at people. So I hope that you guys understand I'm not defending anybody. I would never defend a known and proven child murderer. But what I do have an interest in doing is getting behind the scenes of everybody's thought process and figuring out why they do the things they do or why people think they do the things they do. It has nothing to do with defending Damien. This is telling you his story so that you might be able to understand him better. Because I think the more information we have about people, the more we know their background, the more we know the things they've seen and gone through in their lives, the more accepting and understanding we can come to be about them. That's just being open-minded. I'm not, I'm not defending a child murdering satanic worshiper. It's just being open-minded. And I would ask you all to keep an open mind as well. And please don't write in the comments that God's gonna smite me down because me and God are good. So let's get back to Damien. Damien would grow up basically learning that adults would just come to frustrate him, confuse him, and eventually disappoint him. And now you've got Jack Eccles, who is kind of an asshole and who kind of isn't really nice to Damien or anybody else, yet he seems to be the most religious person ever. So Damien then starts to make a connection between hypocrisy and the Catholic Church. Eventually, Jack Eccles would even make them like move into this church and there was like no windows anywhere but the bathroom and the kitchen. And it was a really strange place to live, but Damien said it was kind of cool. But this is the kind of church where like people get the spirit in them, you know? The, the priest is like walking around touching people like, you're healed, you're healed, you're healed. Eyes rolling back in their heads. Like this is the kind of church that this is. So it's a little ridiculous. And I'm not saying anything about religion. I'm not saying anything about the Catholic church. But to, to be a part of that kind of mass, I guess, where, you know, the, the priest is walking around with like a bottle of olive oil, rubbing it on people, who have like broken legs and saying like, okay, you're good now, you're gonna be healed. It's just ridiculous. Um, and I didn't even think that stuff like that still happened in 1993, but I guess through my research, I find that it still happens even today. But Damien was so little at this point, right? He's like in second or third grade when he's seeing these kinds of things, he starts thinking like, wow, I wish I had that bottle of olive oil. And he, he puts it like together with magic. Jack Eccles would then adopt Damien and Michelle legally and Damien pushed against this at first, but his mother kind of manipulated him in my opinion by telling him if you let Jack adapt you, then your father's not gonna have to pay child support, which he doesn't have the money to pay for anyway. So it's gonna make his life easier. So Damien allowed it to happen because he didn't want to be a financial like drain on his father, knowing how stressed out he was about money. And I think that's wrong to manipulate and control a small child by using their emotions and their innate instinct to protect and help their parents. But then Pam and Jack wanted Damien to call him dad. And Damien really pushed back against this. He was like, this is not my dad. I already have a dad. I'm not gonna call him dad. And Pam and Jack basically like were so mad about this, made his life so miserable. There was always a tension in the house because he would not call him dad. And eventually Damien just caved in and started calling him dad. But he always resented the both of them for kind of forcing him to do this, which I agree, this is unhealthy. As I already told you, he wasn't born Damien, he was born Michael. And he changed his name to Damien. And a lot of people said, when all this was coming out later in his life that he changed it to match the name of the character in The Omen, who was like the Antichrist character, because he wanted to be like the Antichrist, but Damien says that that's not true. Please state your name for the court. Damien Wayne Eccles. Why did you change your name? I was very involved in the Catholic Church. 
and we were going over different names of the saints. St. Michael's was where I went to church at. And we heard about this uh, guy from the Hawaiian, I Hawaiian Islands, um, Father Damien, that took care of lepers until he finally caught the disease himself and died. Was that the reason you chose Damien as your first name? Yes, it is. Okay. Did the choosing of the name Damien have anything to do with any type of horror movies, Satanism, cultism, any of that nature? Nothing whatsoever. Okay. Plus, he just thought it sounded cooler than Michael, which it does. Okay, so now we're going to fast forward. I mean, like I said, if you want to know more details and specifics about his early life, go ahead and read his book, Life After Death. I'll link it in the description and also the audible version, which is what I listened to. But let's fast forward to 1992, where a 16-year-old Damien finds himself in trouble. Now, this was a kid who'd been bullied and pushed around and disregarded by adults for his entire life. So it's no wonder he would grow up to kind of push against authority and not trust the adults in his life or really any adult that he came into contact with. This was a kid who'd had religion pushed down his throat and seen the hypocrisy that can exist in the Catholic Church to an extreme. So it doesn't surprise me that he wanted to search for a higher power and a spiritual connection outside of your traditional Catholic religion. Damien met 15-year-old Deanna Holcomb when she was passing out programs at Michelle's choir concert. So she was standing outside of the auditorium passing out programs and Damien said there was like an instant connection. He was drawn to her and she was drawn to him. So he spent the entire concert that night just standing out in the hallway and talking to her. They began to date and Deanna introduced Damien to her family who Damien says were very welcoming of him, it, like let them into their life and their family, would invite him to family gatherings. They didn't mind having him around, they didn't immediately judge him. And he really appreciated that. But he did say that they were religious and they were very strict, which in hindsight looking back he realizes it was just to protect their daughter. But of course, when you're a teenage boy who wants to get into that daughter's pants, that's not really the best qualities you want to see in the parents of your girlfriend. Right around this time when he met and was dating Deanna is when he discovered the Waco religion. Deanna told him she was a secret pagan and she practiced Wicca and um, she had a little green notebook she would write spells in and incantations. He was like, this is kind of cool and would look into it and research it. And Damien's just that kind of person and I'm that kind of person as well, so I understand it. He's really well read. Even when he wasn't going to school, even when he wasn't having traditional education, he always kept reading and you can tell from the way he speaks and the way he writes that he's incredibly intelligent. He starts kind of looking into the religion, just getting interested in it, and she's obviously keeping the secret from her parents. Now, none of this is crazy at all. This is completely normal for teenage kids to look and explore into different religions. My daughter did it herself. She once had some spices sent to the house, sage and stuff that she wanted to burn to cleanse the, the dark spirits or whatever around the house. Like, I understand it now, but at the time, she was like, I think 14, no, she was younger, probably 13 years old, and I get this package to my house of like herbs, and I'm like, is this marijuana? What is she having sent to my house? Like, and she just told me it's sage and lavender and stuff, but it just was funny that I immediately thought it was like drugs, because I didn't understand. And then when she told me that she was looking into Wicca, I was like, this is weird, but I also just kind of let her do her own thing, because I also, explored different things when I was young. Like I used to astral project and I would swear to you now that I did leave my body and astral project, but it could have just been my imagination, who knows? But at this time in this area, this sort of alternate religion was viewed as witchcraft. In today's day and age, Wicca is considered a valid religion by the US Department of Defense and many people practice it all over the world. So Damien was initially interested in Wicca, but used that as a springboard to look into other religions and other kind of practices. Hinduism, tarot, yoga, meditation, all these kinds of alternate Eastern religion kind of things that interested him because he was like, wow, you can actually 
be spiritual without being religious. You can have a connection to a higher power. It intrigued him and it gave him like a spark of interest and creativity that he'd been missing. He would obviously have no idea that this curiosity in alternate lifestyles and religions would eventually be his undoing. So the problem for Damien started when Deanna's family found out he and, his, and their daughter were having sex and they had a whole plan, Damien and Deanna, so that they could be alone and do what they wanted to do without the watchful eye of her family where she would get on the bus to go to school in the morning and he would wait for her at the school and kind of grab her before she went into school and they would walk to his house and hang out in his room all day doing whatever, you know, listening to music, talking, having sex. And his parents, Jack and Pam, they knew Deanna was there. They knew they were in the room together. They didn't really care, they didn't think much of it, didn't say anything about it. Now this all blew up in their faces one day when they got back to school a couple minutes late. So they had actually missed her bus. Deanna's bus had already left, she wasn't on it, but Damien hadn't known that the bus had already left, so he kind of left her at the school and he walked home. And she ended up having to walk home herself once she figured out the bus had come and gone. Well, Deanna's parents asked her, well, why didn't you ask somebody in the office if you missed your bus for help? And Deanna said, well, I did, but they didn't want to help me. You know, she's 15 years old, she's lying and scared of getting caught, so she just came up with the best thing she could, which wasn't very good, because then Deanna's mother went to the school and like yelled at them and said, why didn't you help my daughter? You made her walk home. And the school's like, uh, Mrs. Holcomb, your daughter wasn't even in school that day, and in fact, she's been missing quite a bit of school lately. So Deanna's then confronted by her parents who, you know, they have the facts now and she kind of doesn't have anywhere to go so she confesses and lets them know what she's been doing. And they obviously lose their mind. I mean, she's 15. She's been skipping school. She's hanging out with this kid. Now they know that she's sexually active. They're afraid of all the things parents are afraid of happening to their young daughters when they become sexually active. So they forbid her from seeing Damien. They're like, this relationship is done. It's over. You're not gonna see him anymore. I suppose the two teenagers thought that Deanna's parents would get over it eventually, but they didn't. And after several months of this, Deanna finally told Damien, I can't do this anymore. I can't have a relationship in secret. I want to be able to be with somebody and not have to sneak around. And his heart was like literally broken. He was devastated. This was his first love and he was obsessed with her. And you know that when you have a relationship like that when you're a teenager, like this person's your world. When you get broken up with or you guys have to break up, you literally feel like you don't wanna live anymore. This is completely normal. And there was something about Deanna that really got Damien. And still to this day, he recalls that connection that he had with her that he could not get over her. At the same time, his home life starts to go downhill as well. Jack lost his job, so he just pretty much spent his days like on the couch yelling at everybody. They were facing money issues again because now Pam's the only one working. And Damien's like heart's broken. He spends most of his time in his room listening to sad, depressing music and would even burn all of Deanna's love letters in the bathroom one day because he just was trying to move on, but he couldn't. So he thought the physical representation of burning her words would actually help him move on. Even though he was still hung up on Deanna, he became involved with Domini Tear, another local girl, basically as a distraction. And he says that him and Domini were friends who had sex basically, and they're, they're still friends today. So he thinks she's a nice person and a good person, but she was a distraction. She was there to fill the hole that Deanna had left in him. Some time had passed and then Damien heard rumors that Deanna had been sexually active with another young man while she and Damien were still together. And so he goes to find this kid, he's pissed, he's angry, he's seeing red, and he finds the kid and Deanna's actually with him. And they kind of are both just like, oh, Damien's here, you know, all scared. And he obviously goes for the kid and tries to beat him up. And then there's rumors saying that he tried to pull the kid's eye out which really you know, started a lot of this whole, like he was violent and he was trouble kind of rumors, but he didn't try to pull the kid's eye out. He was just trying to beat the kid up because he was dating the girl that he loved and had been seeing her while they were still together. So they get pulled apart and he gets suspended from school for this. Deanna and Damien would rekindle their relationship a little bit later. She was in a relationship with this other kid, he was in a relationship with Domini, but they couldn't stay away from each other. You know what I mean? You just have that like connection to somebody that's like a magnet that keeps drawing you together. 
no matter who you are with after, no matter how much time and you know distance has passed between you, there's still always something there that draws you together. And that was what Damien and Deanna found in each other. So they rekindle their relationship and basically say, okay, we're gonna run away. We wanna run away and we'll be together and we'll leave this small town mentality behind us and do whatever we want, we're gonna go to California. So they, neither one of them have a driver's licenses or own a car, so they have to take off on foot. On the last day of school before summer started, they leave school, they've got their bags with them, and they just go walking. Jason Baldwin was actually with them at this point. He was walking with them for a little way. They finally found a an abandoned trailer or like a dilapidated kind of unoccupied trailer at least, and they decide it's really hot out, we're tired from walking, we're dying of heat, let's crash here for the night. So Jason ends up going home that evening, but Deanna and Damien are obviously staying in this trailer for the night before they continue on their westward journey. Damien's still not sure how they got caught. He's not sure who told on them or if anybody saw them, but the police do end up catching them and arresting them. And as they put them in handcuffs and bring them outside, which is crazy to me, like this is a 15 and 16 year old kid who ran away. They put them in handcuffs and they take them outside. Deanna's father's outside and Damien says he kind of came up and put his hand on his shoulder and was like, breathing really hard, like he wanted to hit him, but he was trying to hold himself back. And he puts him and Deanna in the back seat of the cop car. And they're holding hands, you know, so Romeo and Juliet-esque. And she looks at him and says, no matter what happens, promise me you'll come find me. And he says, I promise I will. They kiss, and this was the last time that they saw each other. Damien's brought to Crittenden County Jail, and that's where Jerry Driver, his soon-to-be arch nemesis, would come into his life. He was a juvenile officer for the county and he asked Damien questions about their attempted runaway escape plan. Like what were they doing in the trailer? Why did they decide to go to the trailer? What was their plan? Where were they going? How long were they planning on being gone? And Damien basically you know, told him the truth. Like we didn't really have a plan and we just picked this trailer because it didn't seem like anybody lived there and we wouldn't be caught. But then the subject took like this weird turn into Satanism and Jerry starts asking Damien questions about devil worship and the occult and all this stuff. And Damien's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Jerry Driver then pulls out this little green book, which was Deanna's journal. And at this point, you know, he kind of pulls it out like, I know what you guys are doing. I know you're Satanists and I know something's going on in this town and I will figure out what it is with or without you. So he's obsessed. I do wonder if there's more to the story. I could not find the actual police report, but I wonder if there's more to the story because why would Damien and Deanna both be arrested and put into jail? Because she was put into jail for a little while also, put into jail for running away. And I know they said it was like for trespassing and sexual misconduct, but he was 16 and she was 15. So where's the sexual misconduct really? They're both underage. They're both minors, I guess. So I'm not really sure about the law there. I I just thought of it when I was talking about this portion of the story, so let me know if you guys are more aware of the law as far as sexual misconduct goes when both the kids are minors or under the age of 18. Damien was then given a psychiatric evaluation. According to Damien, he didn't even know he was being evaluated by a psychiatrist until the woman had finished talking to him and looked over at Jerry Driver and was like, yeah, we have a bed for him. While Damien was in jail, he called his mother Pam to talk to her a little bit and then he found out that everybody had had a big week. Like, big things had been happening. Jack Eccles was kicked out of the house Pam was gonna divorce him. He had been accused by Michelle of sexual molestation. So Michelle was Damien's younger sister and Michelle said that Jack Eccles was molesting her basically. And even though Pam didn't believe it, cause this is in Damien's medical records as well, right at the beginning, it says Pam doesn't believe her daughter, but you know, Jack isn't allowed to be anywhere near Michelle anyways at this point because it does go to the officials, so he has to leave. They end up not being together anymore, and then Michelle calls around trying to find Joe, Damien and her father, and she does find him, and he says he's gonna come home and see them. He's been living in Oregon where he's been married and divorced several times at this point, and he has like other children there, but he's gonna come back home and see them. The next day, Joe and Pam came to the jail to see Damien, and Damien said it had been so long since he'd seen his biological father that Joe didn't even recognize him. 
he had to ask Pam, like, is that Damien? And it had been so long, which is so sad. And they told Damien, you know, they, they, there was talk about them getting back together. And Damien's like, this is cool. Like, everything's kind of going well. But at that point, he is sent to a mental hospital because of his previous psychiatric evaluation. Basically, Jerry Driver told him and his parents, like, okay, Damien can face these charges and probably go to prison in due time. Or he can go to a mental hospital for a little bit and get help. And... Obviously, that sounded like the better option. While Damien had been sitting in jail, Jerry Driver actually went to his house and Pam gave him permission to go into his room and look around. And that's when he saw things like, you know, his posters, his skull collection. He found his journals that he'd been writing in and he took those things with him. Let's talk about the skull collection really quick. It's not weird to have a skull collection, especially for a, a boy. A teenage boy or even a young boy like I know my son he's seven and he would if he saw like a little animal skull on the side of the road he would definitely want to bring that home and put it in like his memory box and I think it's weird and gross and I wouldn't want to but some people are into that especially little boys it's just this obsession with like all things morbid Damien is then transported to Charter Hospital in Little Rock Arkansas he's put on antidepressants which make him really like out of it and groggy and he doesn't really like the way that they make him feel but he's put on them so he has to take them he's visited in the hospital by his mother his father and his sister and they inform him when he's released that they're going to be moving again they're going to be moving to oregon where joe actually came from he has kids there so he wants to be with his kids and he wants all his kids there so they're moving to Oregon and normally this would have made Damien really happy to have his family back together knowing that they were going to be in a new place and starting a new life but of course he still hung up on Deanna and he had made that promise to her in the police car that he would come back for her no matter what so he didn't really want to move. Damien's time in Oregon didn't last long. He started working with his father at a gas station and you know kind of making some money here or there but he was depressed. He was sad. He missed Deanna. He didn't have anybody there in Oregon. He didn't know anybody. He wasn't enrolled in school for some reason. His parents had just failed to enroll him in school and they enrolled his sister in school and he was obviously sad. So he actually called Deanna. He tried to reach out to her and when she got on the phone with him, he said she was acting really strange, like quiet and withdrawn. And then she got off the phone with him and told her parents that Damien had called her. They told Jerry Driver. Jerry Driver called the Oregon Police Department and was like, you need to take care of this kid. He's trouble, you need to arrest him. And at first the police department in Oregon was just like, well, is this a joke? Like he can't be arrested for calling his ex-girlfriend in a different state. But Jerry Driver was persistent. Now this is just, I'm just telling you this stuff because I want you to see that Driver had it out for Damien almost since day one. So Jerry Driver's persistent and finally they send a police officer to Damien's house and he sits in his living room and drinks coffee and is like, I don't even know why I'm here. You didn't do anything wrong. This is kind of crazy. He leaves, calls Jerry Driver and he's like, there's nothing on this kid. He's fine. There's no Satanism going on in his house. He's a normal teenage boy. So stop bothering us basically. Damien discovered later that the reason Deanna was acting weird on the phone and would tell her parents about his call was that Jerry Driver had been walking around the Lakeshore area, so the area he was from in Arkansas, and showing people his picture and telling them like all sorts of things about him that he had gone away to a mental hospital because he was a Satanist. He'd been involved in like human sacrifice and he was sacrificing animals and dogs and all this stuff about him. So he's literally just smearing this kid all over town for no reason really because even if that was true why would you be telling people that isn't that kind of private isn't that kind of not your business to tell aren't you a juvenile probation officer don't you have to keep that stuff between you and like the person that you're dealing with one night um damien's feeling extra low and he's not really a big drinker he doesn't even really like beer that much but he wants to sleep and he decides to have some Kahlua and milk. So he's in the kitchen and pouring the Kahlua into the milk and his sister Michelle walks in and he kind of like turns his back to her. He doesn't want her to see what he's doing. So she then goes and tells his mother that Damien's being sneaky in the kitchen. His mother gets on the phone and makes a call and when Damien's walking behind her to his room, he can kind of like hear her on the phone saying, Damien's really depressed. I'm afraid he's gonna hurt himself. I don't know what he's gonna do. And he got 
pissed. He felt so betrayed. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm not going to hurt myself. Why wouldn't you talk to me about it before you called somebody on the phone that you know is going to set this chain reaction of things that are going to happen for me now that aren't good. So he yelled at her. He got into an argument with her. They were screaming at each other. It wasn't good. He was mad. He felt betrayed. And then he just waited there. And eventually a police officer came, took him back to the mental hospital. Damien claims that he knows the actions of his mother were not that of a concerned parent, but that of a drama queen. She always really liked to have something going on, and if something wasn't going on, she had to make something happen. That was just her personality. So while Damien and his parents are sitting in this mental hospital waiting to be admitted, they're kind of like talking to him, and his dad looks at him and he's like, you better start living right, son. You know, this is horrible. This is not the right way to be. And Damien kind of snaps at this point because his father like left them. He walked out on them. He hasn't seen him in years. He went on to try and fail at several marriages and have a couple other kids. And you know, he just hadn't really been the best role model for Damien in life. Damien looks at him and says, I beat you alive. And people took it to mean in the cannibalistic way that he was gonna eat his father, but he obviously meant it like, you have really no place to tell me how to be a man. I dealt with something that you crumbled under. I lived through it and I'm stronger for it. And you are not really the person that needs to be telling me what the right path is to take. I thought that was pretty obvious as soon as I heard it. I don't know why anybody would think like he was threatening to eat his father's flesh, but they did. Damien gets released two weeks later and it's mutually decided between him and his parents that he should probably not live with them and he wants to go to Arkansas, back to West Memphis anyways. His paternal grandparents are there, Jason's there, the only friends he has are there and he'd prefer to live there with them. So he gets on a bus and goes back to West Memphis. When he gets off the bus, the only person he really knows of that's close is Domini. So he goes to her house, she's happy to see him, they kind of strike their relationship back Back up. Damien still says there was never any point where he felt he was in love with Domini. He does say that it was comfortable for him to be with Domini. She was a nice person. He enjoyed her company and it was just something to do. Not long before he's back in town does Jerry Driver show back up into his life and he has him arrested because he says he's breaking the law by being a minor and not being in the residence of his parents. I don't think that's a real law but I don't know what goes on in these small towns. Like this probation officer is just running around arresting people. I don't know why this is happening. Damien's taken into a small office and chained to the chair. And then he's asked all these questions once again about cult activity. And at this point, Jerry Driver has formed an occult task force basically. He's gotten other people on board to help him in his journey of getting the devil out of West Memphis. So he's asked questions about Satanism and animal sacrifice and blah, blah, blah. And Damien's like, I literally don't know what you guys are talking about. This is the umpteenth time you've asked me about this and I keep telling you the same thing. I don't know what you're talking about. Barry Driver, once again, seems to be obsessed with the occult and he's zeroed in on Damien as like the guy who has all the answers, the leader of the local branch of the the devil worshiping cult in West Memphis. So Damien is hospitalized for a short time after this and it's a very short time because I, I think I, in his records it shows like even the doctors were saying we are not really sure why he's here. Yes, he's disturbed. Yes, he's troubled. He's been through a lot in his life and seen a lot of things, has had a tough life, but he's not any more depressed or troubled than really anybody else should be at his age, having seen and gone through these things. And a lot of the doctors do even say he's extremely intelligent. They're impressed with how intelligent he is, even having the low amount of education that he does. So he's in there for about two weeks and then he's released into the custody of guess who? His stepfather, Jack Eccles, who he thought he had escaped. Jerry Driver calls Jack Eccles and he's like, dude, you legally adopted him you need to take care of him now. He's your responsibility. So Damien lives with Jack Eccles again. And it's obviously misery. Jack's, you know, just getting better with age. He's miserable and he hates Damien and his family because he says Michelle ruined his life with her false accusations. And Damien's the visual representation of his failed relationship with Pam and it's just bad. They don't like each other. They don't want to be around each other. So eventually on his mother's advice, Damien does go to the social security office and apply for disability, which he's given. And he's given like a monthly check for his mental disability. Now it's worth mentioning as well, which 
Damien did not put in his book, but it is in his medical records, so that was a little strange to me. While he was in the detention center, he actually tried to suck the blood of one of the fellow inmates. And that kid who he tried to suck the blood from like got freaked out and reported him. Damien admits that he did try to suck this kid's blood, but that the kid knew about it and they had talked about it. The kid was like, okay, he was about it at first. And then after he wasn't, I don't know what happened exactly, but I did forget to mention that while he was in the detention center, he did do that. And there's actually an interview in his medical records where he says they think I'm a blood-sucking vampire and he thinks it's funny because he, he doesn't view himself that way. If you want to look at his medical records, I will link them and you can read that interview for yourself. Damien spends his days in the library. He's not enrolled in school because his parents weren't there to enroll him and they didn't allow him to enroll being underage, which is weird. So he spends his days in the library. He's reading Stephen King books, whatever he can get his hands on. He says the librarians know he loves Stephen King so much that when there's a new release, they hold it in the back for him. He gets his GED. So that was good. That was a good step in the right direction. And then eventually he finds out that Domini is pregnant. I think he realized he was on the path to the kind of life that he'd always judged, you know, get married, have a baby, have a job that doesn't make a lot of money, do nothing, small town, small minds, small dreams. Jerry Driver's still spreading rumors about Damien around town, and at this point, now that Dominique's pregnant, Jerry Driver's telling people that they are having a baby so he can sacrifice the baby to the devil. He claims that Damien had told him previously that he and Deanna were trying to get pregnant so that they could sacrifice their baby to the devil. So as soon as Domini got pregnant, Jerry Driver knew that was the goal of the pregnancy was to have a baby to sacrifice. And there's absolutely no record that Damien ever said this to Jerry, not at all besides Jerry saying that he said it. And I don't even understand why anybody would ever admit to that. So I think it's a lie. But you're welcome to think what you want about it. So obviously with Jerry doing his best to smear Damien's name all over town, it wasn't long before people believed it and would whisper about Damien behind their hands or point at him in public. And if he hadn't felt isolated and different and kind of separate from everybody in the town already, he did now. And I just see him as like this boogeyman figure that parents would tell their kids about. You better behave or I'm going to send Damien Eccles to get you. He worships the devil and he's going to come and get you if you don't behave. And so I even understand how these young kids would grow up being wary of Damien. So now we get to the morning of May 6th. He recalls getting up, having his breakfast, eating a cereal. He turns on the TV to watch cartoons or whatever and like there's this huge news story which is that these three boys were found dead in Robin Hood Hills. Damien claims that he never knew these boys and there's actually no proof that he did know any of the three boys. As far as I could find there wasn't multiple sources citing that he had ever encountered any of the three boys, Chris, Mike, or Stevie. So the first time he's talked to is on May 8th and this is by Steve Jones and somebody named Detective Sudbury. They come to his house and he doesn't realize he's a suspect. They don't say he's a suspect. In fact, the police later would say he wasn't a suspect until June. But why were they talking to him at this point then? And Damien thinks it's just because they thought he knew about like the devil and the occult and so they wanted advice and they were like looking for his help and they basically told him that. They said, we want your help. Do you know anything about these murders? Do you know if this sounds like it's cult related, etc., etc.? And you know, he would say things like, well, I think if somebody did this, they wanted to because people don't usually do things unless it makes them happy. This was then turned into that Damien said, whoever killed the boys is probably happy about it or something like that. So he was kind of putting himself in the shoes of the killer. And that's weird, but at the same time, it's not weird to me because I do that all the time. I'm always constantly kind of like trying to figure out what people's motives are and why they would do things. So I understand why he would do that but it obviously sounded weird to the people interviewing him. So the next day, May 9th, they would talk to Damien again, and they talked to Damien, Jason, and Domini in the front yard of Jason Baldwin's house. So they ask all three, where were you guys on May 5th? What were you doing? What's your alibi? Damien and Jason tell them they'd actually gone to Jason's uncle's house in the afternoon, which the uncle would support, and Jason had to mow his lawn, and then after that, Damien's dad had picked him up from Jason's house 
and they had to run some errands in town, one of which was picking up a prescription for Damien at the local pharmacy, which the pharmacy does also support that that prescription was picked up at that time. Then Damien goes home and he proceeds to spend the evening on the phone with uh, three different girls from Memphis, Tennessee, where he used to live and he still had friends. Now, all three of those girls did come forward and say, yes, he was on the phone with us the entire time that night. He had an alibi and it was cooperated. So even giving an alibi that was cooperated on May 10th that Damien's brought in to the West Memphis Police Department and he's interviewed for eight hours. Not one single minute of that interview was recorded, which was protocol for police at the time. And the West Memphis police did usually record, tape record conversations and interviews and interrogations with these sorts of crimes. Why they didn't record the conversation and the interview is pretty clear to me. I mean, they talked to him for eight hours and they didn't record any of it. They didn't want anybody to know what was being said in that room. I don't know why they didn't want anybody to know what was being said in that room, but to me, that's the logical explanation explanation, if I'm not recording eight hours of an interrogation, it's because I don't really want anybody to know what's being said in this interrogation, besides what we say is being said, which they had plenty to say about what was said. The police came out of this interrogation with Damien and they came to the following conclusions. He had inside knowledge of the crime. He made cryptic statements suggestive of the guilt demonic references and answers, and the demeanor and effect of a killer. So basically they asked him, how do you think the, the boys died? And he said he heard they were mutilated and found in the water, so they probably like drowned or died from their injuries. And at this time, the autopsies of the boys hadn't come back yet. It actually took over a month for the autopsies to come back, which was really frustrating to Gary Gitchell, which is I think one of the reasons why he took Jerry Driver's list of satanic names so seriously, because he was on the medical examiner's ass to get the autopsy back to him. He needed evidence, he needed DNA, he needed something, otherwise they were chasing you know, nothing. They had no information. And so he's on the medical examiner to get him the autopsy and it takes over a month, which is crazy, but they didn't have anything to go on. So maybe when Jerry Driver came with this list of names, Gary was like, whatever, I don't have anything else. Let's just like see what we can do with this. And they were kind of just like killing time and they were kind of just killing time before actual evidence came back. But at this point, like I said, the autopsies had not come back yet. And Damien says that he thinks they probably drowned. The autopsies would go on to show that two of the three boys had water in their lungs, which means they did drown and they were put in the water while they were still alive. Does that mean he had inside knowledge of the crime or does it mean that he heard they were put in the water or they were found in the water so he assumed that they drowned? Damien would go on to say that he never claims that he knew they were drowned, just that he knew they were put in the water. And obviously we don't have proof of what happened during that exchange besides Detective Brian Ridge's written statement and Damien's word. So they're conflicting statements, neither of which have proof to back them up. Once the police realized after several interrogation attempts, they weren't really going to get anything more out of him. They let him go and they focused on an easier target. Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. So they took Jesse into custody at 9 a.m. on the morning of June 3rd. They did not begin to record the interview until 2.44 p.m. So they'd been questioning him for almost six hours before they decided to turn on the tape recorder. This is always going to be a point of contention with the Jesse Miss Kelly confession because there was many, many hours, especially because he claimed initially to not have anything to do with it. There was many hours between him saying he had nothing to do with it and didn't know what they were talking about and his confession like basically implicating himself and Damien and Jason. There was a lot of hours between that where anything could have happened and we don't know. So we need to talk about Vicki Hutchison again really quickly. Remember Aaron's mother, Aaron was a little boy who also pointed the finger at Damien and Jason and Jesse, according to the police. And Vicki initially talks to the police. She actually agrees to become an informant for them. And they tell her that she's gotta get close to Damien and find out what's going on with his devil worshiping cult. She needs to get the inside scoop on that. So she asks Jesse, Miss Kelly Jr., who is always at her house, like hanging out with Aaron, helping her mow the lawn, who knows what else is going on with those two, it's really weird, but she asks him, hey, can you introduce me to your friend Damien? You know him, right? And Jesse was like, I kind of know him. They weren't really friends, they were kind of just acquaintances through Jason. And he's like, yeah, I kind of know Damien. Uh, I guess I can introduce you guys. But he kind of thought it was weird because she's 
a woman in her 30s, like a grown woman with a child, and Damien's a teenager. But he did it anyways because, you know, he, he's naive and innocent and he doesn't think twice about why she might want to be introduced to a teenage boy. This is what Vicky claims in her statement to the police on June 2nd, the day before Jesse is taken in for an interview. So she claims that she met up with Damien, he and Jesse came to pick her up from her house in a red Ford Escort. Now, neither Jesse nor Damien have driver's licenses or own a car, so we're not sure where that part of the story came from, but she says they picked her up and they drove her out into the middle of like nowhere. She doesn't know specifically where it is. She's got all these other details and specific information about everything else, but she doesn't know where this place is, but she does say it's in the woods, next to a meadow, next to some water, which is super specific. That narrows it down for me a lot. She says that they took her to an S-Bat. Now, I didn't know what an S-Bat was, so I had to look it up. S-Bat is basically a, it's like a witch meeting, like a coven meeting. She says they come up into these woods and there's about 10 kids there wearing jeans and their faces are painted black. So these kids are just standing around, you know, talking, shooting the shit, having fun with each other. And then all of a sudden she claims they just start taking off their clothes, at which point she got super uncomfortable and she told Damien, I wanna leave. And he said, okay, and he drove her home in his red Ford Escort that he doesn't own with the driver's license he doesn't have. And she like tells this huge story. I mean, you guys, I'll link her entire statement, her initial statement, but she tells this whole story of how they were like an item and he was cheating on Domini with her and he was obsessed with her and would keep calling her all the time and would be jealous if she was with other men. None of that happened. She later recanted her statement saying none of any of it had happened. She came forward and said, the police basically told her to like look into the occult. They told her to put like witchy things around her house, witch books and Satanism books on her coffee table. She says she did all this. She researched the occult, which is how she was able to come up with the whole S-Bat thing and all the other details. And, and the intention of this was to make Damien feel like he had met somebody who was interested in the same stuff that he was interested in and he would feel comfortable to talk to her. What she really says happened is he came over our house that day. They kind of sat around, they were talking a little bit. And then she asked him about the murders at Robin Hood Hills. And he said, I don't know, I didn't know those boys, but I'm pretty sure the police are gonna try to like get me involved somehow. And she was like, why would they do that? And he's like, because they think it has to do with like devil worshiping and stuff. And they, for some reason, think I have to do with devil worshiping. So I just have a feeling they're gonna like pull me in on this. And then she says they basically like hung out a little bit. They said goodbye and he left and nothing else ever happened and she never spoke to him again. He didn't ever reach out to her again. So she says she made up the whole thing. She says the police basically put all these words in her mouth, told her what to say. I'm not sure if they did. What I do know they did is they dangled a pretty hefty reward in front of her, a reward that would have made a single mother recently unemployed do pretty much about anything. I think that's what happened. There was the reward. She knew if she gave them information, she could get the reward. And she made stuff up to make the information juicy enough to warrant getting a reward. He also says that her son Aaron never named Damien, Jason, or Jesse in his initial interview. She says those names were suggested to him and basically were put to him as a script that he would then have to repeat. So the police told him a story and then told him to repeat the story. I also don't know if that's true, but this is what Vicky says, this is what Aaron says, so they both recanted. I watched the interview video with Aaron and I felt so bad for that kid. I felt so bad for him. He's this little kid. He's obviously uncomfortable. He obviously doesn't wanna be there. He's trying to like change the subject and talk about anything else besides the murders. Okay, did they know you were there? Michael Christmas too. Mm -hmm. When they went out with the <coughs> sure. Okay, when when Jesse was talking to you, did they know you were there? Okay, when Jesse was talking to you about killing the boys, did Michael Chris and Steve know you were there? Um, they did, didn't they? Yes. What were they saying to you? Uh, what were they saying? <coughs> what were they doing? <coughs> they were trying to get it away from Jason, Jason, and Harry. Okay. They were trying to get away. Did they see you? Uh, I don't know. Did they look 
He clearly doesn't want to be there, and it's no wonder that he's so disturbed to this day and had to have tons of therapy. So let's talk about Jesse Miss Kelly's confession. This is the timeline. At 9.45 a.m., Jesse arrives at the police station with the detective Mike Allen. At 10 a.m., Brian Ridge, now remember Brian is the same man who had found the boys' bodies in the creek and had to remove them. So I think at this point he's emotionally invested and wants to like find justice for them. But at 10 a.m., Brian Ridge and Mike Allen give Jesse a pre-polygraph interview. At 11.15 a.m., Mike Allen and Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. leave the police station to go find Jesse Miss Kelly Sr., Jesse's father, so he can get permission for Jesse to be polygraphed. At 11.30 a.m., Bill Durham conducts a one-hour polygraph he claims Jesse showed signs of deception. In fact, I think his actual words were that boy's lying his ass off. At 1240, the post polygraph interview happens with Brian Ridge and Gary Gitchell. At 2.20 p.m., Jesse admits to being present at the time of the murders and between 2.44 and 3.18 p.m., the first interview that's actually recorded happens and then at 3 45, the second recorded interview happens. At 10.35 p.m. that evening, Jason and Damien are arrested at Jason's home. I just want to pop something in here. The morning that Jesse Miss Kelly was brought to the police station, he had to be picked up from the house of Vicki Hutchison, who he had spent the night at her house previous to that. And the day before, which was the day he would have been spending the night at her house, she gave her statement to the police implicating him and saying that she had just been with him at an asbat and he scared her and didn't feel safe around him yet this is a man you let sleep in your house with your child nearby so once again i don't know what was going on with them i get the impression that there might have been some sort of relationship but it's never been proven. So the polygraph exam done by Bill Durham has 10 questions and the report only shows the five questions that indicates Jesse's not being truthful. There was some tactics used in the post polygraph interview that I think were wrong to use, especially on somebody of Jesse's intelligence level. Gary Gitchell basically drew a circle and then he put three X's inside the circle and then put a bunch of X's outside the circle. And he pointed at the X's in the circle and said to Jesse, like, this is you and Damien and Jason. Then he pointed at the 50 X's outside of the circle and said, this is the police. Now, which side do you wanna be on? Do you wanna be inside the circle or do you wanna be outside the circle? Of course, Jesse said outside the circle because who wouldn't? What else are you supposed to say? Are you gonna be inside the circle with these guys we're clearly trying to like send to the electric chair? Or are you gonna be outside the circle with the police who have the power to do that? They also showed Jesse a picture of a deceased Chris Byers. So this shocks Jesse. He emotionally reacts to it. He's like physically revulsed by it. He even like threw himself back in his chair and it really it got to him. He's got a low IQ. This is like showing a small child a picture of another small child dead. It's traumatic. And then they play Jesse this creepy clip of a little boy saying, and no one knows what happened but me. And this is a clip from Aaron Hutchinson's interview where he basically you know, says he was there and all this happened and no one knows what happened but me. So it's like really kind of like creepy and they don't tell Jesse who the voice is or what it means to the case or anything. They just play that one little snippet and it scares him like maybe he thought it was a ghost. He didn't know what to make of it. So between the whole circle tactic the picture and the voice of this creepy little boy saying no one knows what happened but me, Jesse's thoroughly shook, right? They still talk to him for several hours before they turn on the tape recorder. Finally, and I will play you a little piece of his interview. If you wanna hear the full audio, I will link it in the description box. But finally, Gary Gitchell gets Jesse to say what he's wanting him to say the whole time. So at first, Jesse says he wasn't there. He received a call from Jason Baldwin and Damien the night before. 
telling him that they had plans the next day. They were going to find some kids and, and kill them. And does he want to come? And he said, no, I don't, I don't want to come. But then he says they didn't call him until like later that night to say it was done. And then they called him the next day to talk about it. And this doesn't make any sense to me because if you hadn't been murdering with these kids before, why would they call you and ask you if you wanted to? I don't know, but why would they do that? It doesn't make any sense. But that's what he says happened. And then he starts talking about going to these witch meetings and these cult meetings where there's briefcases of drugs and they would build a fire and they cook and eat dogs. Meetings are usually about eight or nine people. They meet up in the woods and they have orgies after the meetings. And the meetings are usually on Wednesdays at around eight or nine. He says that Jason Baldwin carries a folding knife, but Damien does not have a knife. So at first the progression starts with him saying, I have nothing to do with it when he gets the polygraph. And then they tell him that, no, you were lying. The polygraph says you were lying. And the polygraph's a scientific machine. It hooks right up to your brain and it can read what your brain says. So you're lying. Jesse didn't know anything about polygraphs. This was fairly new technology and definitely new to West Memphis. So he literally thought like that machine read my brain. Am I lying? So then he talks to them and tells them, okay, I was on the phone. They told me they were going to do this. But then Detective Brian Ridge leaves the room and Jesse's left alone with Gary Gitchell. And finally, somehow Gary gets him to confess to being there, taking part in it and, you know, witnessing the entire thing. Gitchell claims that he broke down and began crying and just spilled everything out. And that's when he was like, okay, hold on. We better get this on tape. I did also notice that there was a arrest record for Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. I did notice that there was an arrest record for Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. that it was for capital murder and that it was timestamped 244. One minute before Jesse would give his alleged tape recorded confession. This is already a really long video, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through the things that he was wrong about in his confession. He starts off saying that this was early in the morning that they went to Robin Hood Hills, 9 a.m., and then the cops are leading him. They're always leading him. And if you don't believe me, you can listen to his interrogation. They are leading him often. But he says at first it was 9, and then they're like, you sure it wasn't later? Maybe you woke up at 9, and then you went out there, and then he's like, oh, maybe it was like noon. And then they're like, wait, was it noon or was it after school? And he's like, no, I didn't go to school that day. And they're like, no, not you. The boys were in school that day. So it would have had to have been after school that you saw them. And he's like, no, they skipped school that day. And about what time was it that all this was taking place? They called me about. I'm not saying when they called you. I'm saying what time was it that you were actually there in the park? I was there about 12. About noon? Okay. Was it after school? I'd let out? What well, these no, other boys? No. They, they skipped school. They skipped they school. They were going to catch their bus or stuff and they was on their bikes. And the police are like, crap, we're not getting what we need. And they're like, okay, so was it getting dark? Was it like around this time? Was this happening? And then at a later point in the interview, I think it was Brian Ridge says to Jesse, okay, so remember you told me earlier that this was about like eight o'clock that this happened. Um, was it eight o'clock or was it a little earlier or later? And Jesse had never at any point in that recorded interview at least said, that it was at eight o'clock or whatever. So they're clearly just kind of trying to plant things in his head. And then they ask, what were the boys tied up with? And he says rope, but they weren't. They were tied up with shoelaces. And they also ask him, you know, to point out who did what to which boy. And he's getting their names wrong. He's pointing at a picture and saying the wrong name, just not even pronouncing their names correctly. And he's mixing them all up. And finally, they just put the pictures out in front of him and they say, you can just point to the picture. You don't have to say the name because they realize that he's not giving accurate details and they don't want him to keep talking if it's going to make him sound like he's not telling the truth. Now, I know that it's hard for anybody, including me, to look at somebody who has confessed to everything and to say, well, why would they lie? But false confessions do happen often. And there are a lot of tactics that are used by the police force to elicit such confessions. And I don't always think they do it on purpose. 
I think sometimes they, they just think that this is the way to make them talk, but they do sometimes get fake information just because the person wants to go home. And they did tell Jesse, like, if you just tell us what you gotta tell us, you can go home. And they never let him go home. He's like a kid. He was like, let me just say what I have to say so I can get out of this police station and go home because that's all I want to do right now. So you can think about the confession, what you would like to think about it, but I would ask first that you listen to it and read the transcript, both of which I will link in the description, and kind of tell me that you don't sense the police are leading him down the path that they want him to go down. I'm gonna play you a little portion of the interview that I thought was obvious police intimidation or suggestion where they ask Jesse, where were the boys wounded? And you know, he's saying like on their face and then he says on their bottom. And they, you know, they didn't have any wounds on their bottom, but the police officer's like, what do you mean on their bottom? Do you mean on their genital area, like here? Do you know what a penis is? And he's like saying, it, was it here? And pointing, you know, on the picture. You saw somebody with a knife. Who had a knife? Jason. Jason had a knife. What did he cut with a knife? What did you see him cut, or who did you see him cut? I saw him cut one of the little boys. All right, where did he cut him at? He was cutting him in the face. Cutting him in the face. All right. Another boy was cut, I understand. Where was he cut at? At the bottom. On his bottom? Was he face down and he was cutting on him, or? He was. Now you're talking about bottom, do you mean right here? Mm -hmm. In his groin mm -hmm. area? Okay. So oh, right. you know what his penis is? Yeah, that's where he was cut at. That's where he was cut. Which and boy was that? That right there. The, you're talking about the Byers boy yeah. again? Okay. Are you sure that he was the one that was cut? That's the one I seen him cutting on. Okay. Right. Do you know what a penis is? Yes. All right. Is that where he was cutting? That's why I seen him going down that. And so he's literally not asking him, wait, can you be more specific about where on the bottom? Can you point for me? He like pointed for him and was like, this, this place right here? And you're not supposed to do that in questioning. Like you're giving the person the information you want them to give back to you. You're planting a suggestion in their mind, especially the mind of Jesse Miss Kelly Jr. who's not like really smart and who also has been there all day and is tired and like out of it. So it was pretty clear to me that a lot of this confession was provided by the West Memphis Police Department. Jesse also says that the boys were raped and they weren't. There was no sign of sexual abuse on the boys besides the castration, which we will explain that later, but there was no sign of sexual abuse on these three boys. So it kind of boggles my mind how so much can be wrong with an interview and with a confession and, which, and with the facts, and the police can still use it to go arrest two more people.